Okay, so we now come to the last session uh, of today. <clears throat> Just to recap, uh, I highlighted to you how a structured question, in this case, a question published in an article concerning the protocol of a systematic review that evaluated tests uh, for their uh, accuracy in predicting a particular outcome in a particular population. And I emphasize to you that the purpose of this second step in systematic review is to produce the following uh, efforts and outputs. <clears throat> the search term combination, uh, using and and or correctly to describe the search strategy. This is best done by including an appendix that includes the search term combination. It's also considered a good practice uh, to include a list of excluded studies, giving the reason as to why they were excluded. This can be presented as an appendix. And figure one, which is a flow chart of the study selection. And then some assessment of the risk of publication and related biases. And I demonstrated to you how funnel plot may be created and its asymmetry assessed. We'll briefly go over this one more time to ensure that you've picked this up correctly. And uh, I demonstrated to you how point estimate of odds ratio is calculated. And then from this point estimate, uh, I plotted it on what is called a forest plot, where we have a scale. After being disconnected, are you hear me? 
Okay, I've just got two responses. All right. Look, I am sorry, my connection where I am in Malaysia is not the best, but I hope it will continue stable until we finish. So I wanted to explain to you once again how uh, effect size was used to evaluate the risk of publication bias. Uh, so this forest plot has a scale where one shows no effect. In this example where pregnancy was the outcome measure, the value above one shows an effect in favor of intervention and values less than one show uh, no effect of the intervention. And here is our point estimate of three that we calculated and it's confidence interval, which reflects the sample size of the study. And here they pay maybe another study in this topic, which is larger. So you can see that its effect size uh, is possibly in, in this particular example, the same, but because of its size, the confidence interval is smaller. And there are possibly two other studies where the point estimate in one case is less than one. The other case is much greater than three. So this study shows much greater effect. This one shows no effect. Which of these two studies is likely to be missing from the literature search? Would you like to hazard a guess? So Esther says a negative study is likely to be missing. And I presume you say it is missing because it is negative. So perhaps the authors are less motivated to write it up, are less motivated to submit it. And the editors are less likely to recommend it for publication. Okay, so given that this risk of missing studies exists, we can capture this by an analysis called funnel plot analysis, where we plot effect size versus a measure of study size. And we expect that the smaller studies will be distributed on both sides of the larger studies. And this plot is called symmetrical. Where the studies are missing, this is called asymmetrical. And uh, with this, we have an assessment of what is the possibility that we have some missing studies. So having done this, the next step in systematic review is for us to evaluate the quality of the studies. So the quality assessment of, uh, of the included studies is what shows us what really the literature is about in terms of its worth. And by quality, we mean that the study is free of bias, that it is internally valid, that it does not have any systematic error. And design-related bias is assessed by a hierarchy of evidence. And bias in conduct and analysis is assessed by applying a detailed assessment using an existing checklist or adapting one for our own review. And this type of evaluation ought to be presented in the form of a table, possibly with a figure, and subsequently in meta-analysis, may be used in subgroup analysis and meta-regression, and finally in making inferences at the time of writing the discussion. So the key thing that we see in this figure are the various lists of flaws that can exist in published literature. 
And lack of blinding or lack of control group, for example, is highlighted here. And lack of control group is captured here where we highlight that case series without control group are at the bottom of the hierarchy of evidence. And randomization uh, is at the top of the hierarchy of evidence. Uh, and in between are non-randomized studies where control groups exist. Uh, so at the time of making selection criteria for our step two in a systematic review, we could state at the beginning that we will only include studies with randomized design, or we will only include studies with uh, a control group. We will exclude studies with case series. So this type of um, threshold for study selection can be based on uh, this hierarchy of evidence. Now, when it comes to making a detailed assessment of the study, we need to go back to look at the study design uh, in terms of its flow as described earlier by way of participants, interventions, and outcomes. Goes without saying that we expect the sample to be representative in order for the results or effect size obtained to be generalizable. But this is an element of external validity, not internal validity. For internal validity, we are looking at elements like the ones described here, called selection bias, performance bias, or measurement bias. So selection bias creates groups that may not be use of randomization. And another way to deal with this problem in observational studies is to undertake multivariable analysis that, that controls for the confounding effect of differences between groups. With respect to performance bias, we are looking at whether the groups constituted at the beginning of a study were treated differently in ways other than the assigned intervention and control. And this problem is prevented by blinding both uh, the participants and the carers. The third problem of measurement bias is captured by, uh, the, by problems that may arise in classification of the outcome. And this problem is prevented by using blinded outcome assessors. But also we can use outcomes that are objective so that subjectivity does not play a role and the absence of blinding may not, in this case, uh, adversely affect measurement. And finally is uh, attrition bias which refers to, to losses to follow up affecting the estimation of the effect size. So if studies are not blinded, they tend to produce an effect size larger than in studies that are blinded. This means that we get an impression that intervention is more effective if there is lack of blinding. Here are some things that we look for in a detailed quality assessment uh, at various steps of data extraction with respect to the internal validity assessment or quality assessment of the selected studies. And this is how we tabulate our findings. The table, for example, here, assessment of randomization described as present or absent with one or zero as being uh, the 
the, the, the score. And if the study has blind, has concealment of randomization in, in addition to correct uh, method of generating randomization sequence is given an additional point. On the other hand, a point is deducted if there is no concealment of randomization. Similarly, double blinding now captures performance bias and measurement bias, and it can be scored. And withdrawals and dropouts capture attrition bias. And out of a total of five, we can have a score. And using a threshold of three, we can say that the study has high or low quality. So I'm going to just stop here for a moment and see if colleagues have any questions. Do, do I take it that it's all to proceed to the next stage, which is to think about how this info, oh, suddenly we have a couple of questions. So Ma Marcia says it's clear uh, Esther has no problem, Eva uh, similarly has all clear. So thank you three of you for confirming that uh, this was clear. So one way of presenting information concerning quality is to tabulate in this manner, as you see here. Another way to present the same information is to create a figure, especially if you have studies with more than one designs included. So in this review, we have care cohort studies as well as, as cross-sectional studies present. And the checklist for assessing the quality of these type of studies is, is slightly different from each other. So here we can see that a graph can be used to demonstrate which studies score yes or on various items and which studies don't score anything on that item. And then using all of this information, how many studies overall have good quality uh, amongst cohort studies and uh, among cross-sectional studies. So at this stage, I'm just going to take stock of where we are. Um, we have gone through framing the question for a systematic review. We have gone through literature search uh, for a systematic review. In the literature search, we have clarified that uh, we need to be reporting the search term combination, the list of excluded studies with reason for exclusion, uh, the flow diagram of inclusion of studies, and an assessment of the possibility of publication bias affecting our search. Then we have now covered an aspect of data extraction of the selected studies with respect to their quality. In this step of data extraction, the key thing is that the data are extracted by two people and 
if the two people agree with each other, then we will be able to demonstrate by, an, by a statistical analysis called the Kappa statistic that the percentage agreement amongst people extracting data independently was high, increasing the confidence that the extracted data are uh, reliably extracted. And then for the, extra, for the selected studies, we can create a table of study characteristics and these study characteristics would relate to the participants, the types of uh, exposures or interventions and outcomes uh, with respect to the question we framed. And soon after looking at these, the quality of the studies would need to be uh, summarized and then presented. And I highlighted that the quality has been uh, already addressed inside your research question, because when we talked about study design as an element of uh, research question, we were already talking about what is the minimum level of quality we would accept to permit studies to enter our systematic review. And this is design related criteria for study selection applied in uh, the second step. And then for those studies that have met this minimum threshold, we carried out a detailed assessment of quality, um, which I showed you in the form of a scoring system a moment ago. And using this uh, detailed assessment, we can present the information in form of a table or figure. And tomorrow we are going to look at how we can use the information concerning quality in various forms of uh, uh, meta-analytic techniques that we will deploy before we generate in inferences. And for construction of table, I showed you an example where it's possible to see how the various biases in selection performance measurement and attrition can be presented in a simple way and then summarized as a score, or they can be presented as a figure. So with this, I'm going to stop the presentation today uh, and I'll leave you to ask me any final questions and also, uh, highlight anything you would like me to cover uh, in the session on Friday. So the, the stage is uh, now set for you to raise any questions about uh, question framing, study selection, and study quality assessment. Can you please show the previous slide again? Absolutely. This is the slide concerning uh, concerning tension uh, of findings of uh, quality assessment. Uh, would you mind explaining again the uh, attrition bias? Uh, maybe my audio wasn't working before. No problem. And I don't really get what should we uh, look in this. Um... Okay, I'm going to take you through this one more time because this information I really skipped over during my talk. So thank you for bringing this up. You will remember that I presented this slide earlier in the calculation of effect size. And uh, I reminded you that in any study, there are patient or data losses. 
And in this example, I explain to you that we will assume that nobody is lost. And I also said, this is a hypothetical example. In real life studies, generally, there is an element of patient or data loss that is unavoidable despite all the efforts made by researchers. So these patients or data lost in a study are what cause attrition bias. And attrition bias need to be dealt with by avoiding any data loss, number one, if that does not work out, which will be expected, then to report all the data lost as part of reporting of the flow of patients in your study. And finally, taking account of the lost patients in an analysis that uh, adjusts for the losses. So that type of analysis is called intention to treat analysis. Um, so just now, coming back to the issue you asked me to explain, what is attrition bias? Then attrition bias is something that would affect the calculation of effect size because either we do not know about whether patients have been lost or we know patients have been lost, but the, lost, the loss has not been adjusted for in the analysis presented. So this is what is attrition bias in a nutshell. Does that make sense? In, enough, thank you. <laughs> okay, so th thank you for raising that. And uh, this gave me the opportunity to explain one more time what is uh, attrition bias. I'm very happy to explain anything unclear again or address any questions uh or take any comments please go ahead uh, i have a question um can you hear me found your question in the chat uh can you hear me now i can hear you now yes thank you um for example, uh, my, the systematic review that I'm currently uh, writing uh, only includes preclinical studies, so in vitro studies. And I wanted to ask uh, if all those um, biases are also um, true for preclinical studies. Uh. Because yes. I know that most preclinical studies um, do not even mention uh, randomization and blinding and so Well, on. look, <clears throat> for each type of study, there is a different checklist for assessment of quality. So you need to identify a checklist that will help you capture the quality of the preclinical studies. So I show you here a website called Equator. And in the Equator website, you find checklists for reporting. So here you can see animal preclinical studies. Here is a checklist available for reporting of animal studies. And if your preclinical studies are animal studies, then you can take this checklist and take some items that you feel are relevant for your question and apply them um, in your review to undertake the detailed quality assessment of the studies. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So here is just one way of going about how to identify quality assessment items 
for your question. So thank you for bringing this up. It also gives me the opportunity to clarify that the quality assessment system I presented in my slides here typically is employed for evaluation of randomized control trials. If randomization is used in a preclinical study, in an animal study, for example, then an assessment of this kind could be considered for application in such a research question. On the other hand, if randomization is not a relevant issue for a preclinical study, then you will need to find other quality assessment items. These will not apply. So happy to take uh, one further question or comment before we before we come to the end of today's uh, session. Okay, so I, I would be grateful if you could make any last comments via chat or by unmuting your microphone um, in the next uh, remaining couple of minutes. If not, then I'd like to thank you for uh, persevering through today, especially during the, the, the lost connection. Uh, we started with 59 colleagues and we are finishing with 52, so that is not that bad. Um, and I hope to see you on uh, Friday when we will cover in more detail uh, 